But this current dynamic where we don't save and we don't produce is not viable. And the same Wall Street economists that told us the internet era was a new era are now telling us that this current era of American consumption and global production is viable, and it's not. You know, it, it almost re reminds me a lot of that, that book, uh, Tom Sawyer, you know, where Tom is able to convince all of his friends to whitewash his fence for him, and to not only do that, but to pay him for the privilege. Because Tom Sawyer got his friends so convinced that there was so much joy in this toil that it was worth paying him. And so he got the world to, to do his chores. And little did uh, you know, Samuel Clemens realize that that little passage in that book would one day form the basis of the global economy, where America convinced a billion Chinese to paint our fence and to pay us for the privilege. That's going to end. In fact, when I used to talk to potential clients and clients in 1997 and 98 and 99 and tell them that the NASDAQ was going to lose 80 and 90 percent of its value, people thought that there's no way that that could possibly happen. I mean, people used to even tell me the government won't let that happen. Well, it happened. A lot of people today in the real estate market have the same idea when I tell them that property prices are going to drop 50, 60, 70, 80 percent. They don't think it can happen. They don't think the government will let it happen. Well, it happened in the stock market, and it's going to happen in the real estate market. And a, and a, and a nation is no different than, than an individual. Just like if there's one individual who works hard and doesn't take many vacations, doesn't buy new cars, doesn't eat out a lot, saves a lot for his retirement, you know, he's building something for the future. You take another uh, similar situation, a guy with the same income, but saves nothing, takes out a second mortgage on his house, you know, doesn't have a retirement account, you know, doesn't save for his kid's education, and just spends everything he earns, initially that person's economy looks pretty good if you simply measure it based on consumption, which is what we do when we measure our GDP. But we're not, you're not looking beneath the surface to say, at what expense is this consumption being funded? Anyway, coming back to where we are as an economy, we had the real estate bubble that blew up. Americans took on a lot of debt. We spent a lot of money. Where are we now? Well, over the next year or two, you've got about $2 trillion of adjustable rate mortgages that are going to reset. Now, where are our homeowners going to get the money to make these mortgage payments? It's not like they're sitting on a pile of cash. They're spending 40% of their income on their mortgage now at the low rate. How are they going to afford to make these payments when the rate's 8% or 9%? A lot of people are going to lose their jobs because Americans are struggling to make mortgage payments instead of spending money on what they're spending it on now. Also, of course, a lot of people don't realize this too, but one of the things that the Clinton administration did and the, and the Bush administration was we put the entire country on an adjustable rate mortgage. The U.S. government used to finance its borrowings with 30-year paper. Now the, the average maturity on the national debt is under three years. It's almost $9 trillion in debt. With, with, uh, as, an, as an adjustable rate mortgage. So as interest rates rise, it's going to impact the federal budget. Why are real estate, why did they get so high in the first place? Why did they get there? Well, they got there because of the artificially low interest rates that existed. Well, those artificially low interest rates are not there anymore. Rates are still not high, but they're not nearly as low as they were. And without those very low rates, these prices are impossible because people can't get payments that low. They also were there because of the complete abolition of lending standards. And number three was the speculative mentality of the buyer. Now, one of the reasons that people were, were buying real estate, let's say someone in California who believed this house was going to appreciate by 20% a year. Let's assume my income is $5,000 a month, but I'm going to buy a house where the mortgage payment is $4,000 a month. Well, no sane person would commit 80% of his income to making a mortgage payment. But wait a minute. If I'm expecting that house to appreciate by 20% a year, my real income isn't the 50000 I earn as a, as a policeman. It's the $100,000 a year or $200,000 a year I'm going to earn as a homeowner. So they, they, they take a look at that money and they figure that's my real income. So they get one of these no-doc loans, one of these liar's loans that you guys came up with, and they say, my income is 150000 a year. I qualify for that loan. But more importantly than the buyers, 
are the lenders who are not going to lend. And the big, you know, the big part of this problem has been from the lender's perspective. You know, back in, traditionally, the way people bought a house is they went to a bank, and the bank wrote them a mortgage. And the bank held that mortgage for 30 years. And so the bank had a big vested interest in the loan getting repaid. Also, when the appraiser was hired, it was hired by the bank, and the bank wanted that appraisal to be accurate because that was what it needed if there was a default. It had to know, what is this asset worth? Because I'm going to carry this note on my books for 30 years. If this guy doesn't pay, what can I sell this property for? Now, how does the lending industry work today? Well, you've got this huge moral hazard built in, and a lot of it was created by government and the guaranteed mortgages of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, but what happens is you've got a whole bunch of people in this room that are lending money. But when you lend the money, does anybody in this room keep that loan? No, it gets sold. It gets repackaged, and these other companies buy them. And then they repackage them again, and they get sold to Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley. That creates these uh, collateralized mortgage obligations. Or they sell them to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that just buy them if they're conforming loans. So what happens is the lenders just want to make loans. They don't care if they're ever repaid because they're not going to own the loan. Now all of a sudden, when they hire an appraiser, do they want an appraiser who's going to give an accurate appraisal? No. They want an appraiser who's going to appraise the property high enough to fund this loan. The appraisers know that. The appraisers want to get jobs. They want to get hired. Who hires them? The mortgage lenders. If a guy keeps coming in with low appraisals, he's not going to get any work. So the appraisers have an incentive to inflate the value of the home. Of course, the buyers, they don't care. They just think it's all going to go up. Let me tell you a little bit about the uh, the uh, subprime market, which I'm actively involved in shorting right now, but to show you what's going to happen, the way this subprime market works, and I didn't even realize this until I did the research to start shorting the stuff, but 65%, 65% of the subprime mortgage market, 65% of, of those bonds, of, the, of those mortgages where a guy stated income, no doc, negative AM, risky loans, 65% of those things are repackaged by Wall Street and rated triple A, triple A. The equivalent of sovereign debt of the best credit quality governments in the world. How can it possibly be that 65% of the subprime mortgages that are issued get a rating at triple A? How can that be? Well, the reason is Wall Street creates these tranches of uh, uh, CMOs a billion dollars worth of mortgages. And the way they structure it is they insulate the top 65% from losses by saying all the losses from interest and principal are going to go to these riskier tranches. The riskiest tranche, which represents 1% 1 1 of the market, 10 million face, that risky tranche gets all the losses first. So that tranche has to be wiped out before any other tranche um, loses one dime of interest, let alone principal. Now that particular piece of paper is rated triple B minus and yields about seven and three quarters percent right now. That piece of paper should be rated F and it will go to zero, as will several other tranches above it. Right now, one of the big trades that is starting on Wall Street and which I'm participating in is shorting that tranche. A lot of the, bro uh, the brokerage firms now are creating derivative instruments where you can do these credit default swaps and you can bet on those things defaulting. Now what's going to happen as more and more people put this trade on, the price of those bonds is going to start to fall. As the price of those bonds, those risky tranche bonds falls, the yields are going to shoot up. When that happens, it's going to make it impossible for Wall Street to collateralize this debt because it's going to be too expensive. Rates are going to rise and the bottom is going to drop out of the subprime market. Of course, a lot of property is going to be coming on the market over the next year or two because as I said, when these adjustable rate mortgages reset, a lot of people are going to be in a situation where they can't make these payments. Even if they cut back everywhere, they can't make these payments. And of course, a lot of them are going to be unemployed if they happen to work in the service sector and they've lost their jobs because other people have, made, have cut back. So a lot of properties are going to come on the market. If you think there's a high inventory now, wait a while. Who's going to buy these properties if there's no credit flowing? In fact, there was a whole lending industry constantly lowering their standards and lowering their standards, which enabled prices to rise. Historically, 
the lenders provided a check on home prices. And if you look at a chart, you go back like 100 years, and you look at the price of houses in the United States until 2000, it matched the CPI. That's basically all that happened is housing prices basically stayed even with the CPI. It wasn't until 2000 it went off the charts because something weird happened. The fact of the matter is the economy hasn't been humming. All we've been doing is going on a consumption binge just like the heroin addict. These numbers are false. All they're measuring is how much wealth we're dissipating, not how much wait, we're producing. Wait, we're borrowing money from the Japanese and the Chinese to buy the products that they produced on credit. We're going to go through a painful correction. Anybody that thinks that we're going to go from such a wide, out of whack imbalance, and all of a sudden we're just going to turn a little switch and it's going to be like a little, you know, not a big deal, is fooling themselves. It's, you know, just like when people told me, when I said the Nasdaq's going to drop 80 to 90 percent, of course I was right. Oh, no, no, it's only going to go down 10 percent or 15 percent. No way. We are way out of balance. We're not going to have a little mild recession. This is a major economic contraction that's coming, and the real estate market and the mortgage market is right in the forefront.